All right, everyone, welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors. My name is Corey Janoff, joined as always by Rochelle Vanderzanden. I'm here too. Hello, everyone. Whoop, whoop. And you know, today we wanted to, to go back to an episode we did a handful of episodes ago called Big Things Matter More Than Little Things, where we spent time talking about how little stuff like your Starbucks coffee really doesn't matter. Go spend money on your coffee each morning. It's not going to hurt you financially in the long run. But the big things like how much you spend on your house or your car or your children, you know, are we sending them to private school? How many kids do we have in general? You know, travel vacations that we take, um, you know, that's going to impact the budget a lot more. And then on the other side of it, you know, how much you save, how much you invest regularly over time matters a heck of a lot more than what specific stock you pick or mutual fund you invest in, you know, or your exact asset allocation. I mean, sure, that can impact long-term returns, but the biggest driver of your ability to reach your financial goals will just be how much you're saving towards those goals and how realistic those goals are. Uh, but today, we wanted to talk about how little things matter and 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 matter a lot in some cases. And, uh, you know, it's really the idea that small micro actions compounded consistently over time can really lead to big results and you know you sometimes see this stuff in those self-help books and you know there's a lot of uh, material about it but i think if you really dig into it, it it's so true you know one example um you know that uh that i thought of it happens to a lot of people is just you, know, you you look at um, weight gain or weight loss. You know, you, let's say you're for for the guys out there. You know, you, you maybe you graduate from college at 22. You're weigh maybe 165 pounds, and then you go to med school and you don't exercise as much and you eat more junk and maybe you you know you put on two pounds in a year. No no big deal, just a tiny little bit. But what if you put on two pounds every single year? You know, 30 years from now, you're you're weighing. 225 pounds instead of 165 pounds. You know that's a that's a lot of extra, extra a lot of extra weight you're packing over 30 years. Um, but the reverse can happen too. Like you know you could shed a couple pounds a year. And you know, we have a you could actually shed a lot more than that. We have a guy in our office who during the pandemic just started walking and he dropped 50 pounds in about 15 months. You know just by walking, walking it off. So it's. Uh, yeah, you know, it's easy to go in reverse too if you just take the effort to do it consistently every single day over time. But, I know uh, that there's even just little things from working in the pandemic that have made a lot of those kinds of health changes for people. So just me sitting at my desk every day was not great and like just not getting up to walk out the door and, and walking out and about because we didn't go out and about very often changed, you know, how I was feeling physically. And then we got a little tiny dog. And now I walk all over the place, everywhere, all the time, because we have to chase her and take her out to go to the bathroom so she stops peeing on the carpet. <laughs> but like even those really small things, even over a short period of time, have made a pretty big difference for me. So. Yeah, do you have one of those like Fitbits or Apple Watches that tracks your steps or miles no. a day? No, but I can definitely tell. I can yeah. definitely <laughs> tell that the level of activity has increased for sure. It yeah, and I know, is, like you, Corey. Yeah, tell us. About, I know you have a treadmill in your office. I'm surprised yes. you're walking on it right now. Well, I, I think I've walked about eight miles already today. So yeah, <laughs> about a year ago, I bought one of those walking treadmills. I think it was like 500 bucks. It's just a low profile. sits under the desk. There's no bars or handles or anything. It just has an on-off button. Has a little remote so you can change the speed. I think the max speed is maybe five miles an hour. Um, but, you know, when I'm on the phone or, you know, answering emails, I'll just turn it on, walk for an hour and, you know, three miles an hour, there's a mile. And uh, you do that a few times a day. Before you know it, you've walked nine miles in a day. Um, and, you know, even like you can toy around with the speed, too. Like, let's say I, I do three hours a day um, at, at three miles an hour. Well, what if I up the speed to three and a half miles an hour? You know, it's not a really big difference, hardly noticeable, uh, but you, you log an extra one and a half miles over a three hour span. And that, that, if you do that every week, let's say I do it three days a week, you know, there's an extra four and a half miles a week. Maybe I'm in the office 
45 weeks a year, take some vacations, you know, skip out a few days here or there, but you know, that's an extra, just that half a mile an hour difference. That's an extra 200 miles a year, not to mention the, you know, whatever, 12,000 miles from just the regular <laughs> eight to 10 miles a day that you end up doing it. But I mean, 200 miles extra per year, you know, I don't, I don't know how many calories you burn. Maybe I think I've heard like a hundred per mile. I think it varies by your size. You know, it, you burn a 200 pound person's going to burn more energy to propel themselves a mile versus like a 120 pound person. But let's say I burn a hundred calories a mile, you know, that's uh it's like 20,000 extra calories burned per year. It's like 20 cheeseburgers. Like I can eat a lot more <laughs> of the food that I love and uh, I not like feel dirty about it. <laughs> yes. thousand pound or a thousand calorie cheeseburgers. That's amazing right now. Let's well, if you ever looked at like that. <laughs> the menu at Cheesecake Factory, their burgers are like 1800 Ugh. calories. <laughs> that place is terrible. Yeah, I mean, micro action, don't ever go. probably 300. <laughs> <laughs> It's got a lot of sugar in it, probably. Anyway, <laughs> I am impressed with your ability to walk and type at the same time. I must say, I don't know that I, I thought could it do would that. be. I thought it would be more challenging, but it's really not as hard as I thought. So mm -hmm. it's very yeah. doable. I think just one more like health example because this is a really good parallel. Well, like small differences can can make a big impact long term. But let's say that you're a soda drinker. You know, let's say you have a, a can of Coke or a can of Pepsi once a day and it's about 150 calories or so. You know, if you're doing that walk of two miles and, and burning 200 calories, but then you also cut out that can of soda every day, that's then like 350 calories every day that you're earning yourself. Um, definitely going to probably start shedding some pounds at that point if you're if you're burning that many calories or reducing that many calories from your life. And you're not going to notice right away, but after a while, like those things start to, to grow on top of yourself, you'll probably feel, feel better pretty quickly. But really, that's like 10,000 calories a month and 120,000 calories a year. And it's going to make a big difference for people. Um, so again, I mean, not necessarily a recommendation to go on a diet, but just an example that like small changes can make a big difference in our health and in our finances, which is where we're going to get to next. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's perfect because it's not like you're totally changing everything that you do. It's just, all right, cut out one can of soda, which I guess for some people might be their guilty pleasure each day. But still, it's not like you're changing your life for it. And then walking two miles sounds like a lot, but, you know, take the dog out, put on a put in the earphones, listen to a podcast. You know, it only takes about <laughs> 40 minutes to walk two miles at a leisurely pace, you could probably speed it up and get it done in a half an hour or get one of those walking mm -hmm. treadmills and put it in your house while you're watching TV. <laughs> and, uh, and there you go. So just a Absolutely. little small micro actions compounded over time, and, you know, it really adds up. Maybe this is where that Starbucks analogy comes into. Maybe it's not Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Maybe it's your Starbucks latte. Yeah, the, cut up a latte. There's vanilla like 500 syrup. calories. <laughs> yeah, depending on what you got. Absolutely. So, I mean, when we take this and we apply it to our finances, like the things that we're talking about is, you know, putting a little bit extra towards your long-term savings every month, every year, putting a little bit extra towards your debt every year. Like those kinds of things can have a big impact because of that compounding interest. So we're going to walk through a few kind of heavy numbers examples here. So, so try to follow along with us, but Let's say that you save $100 a month from age 25 to 65. If we assume that you get like a 7% rate of return, which is fairly average, then that's equivalent to about $275,000. Um, so you could invest a total of $49,200. That's all it is really added up, but it turns into $275,000 because you're investing it, because you're getting that compact, um, compounding interest. But and full you know, disclosure, we, yeah, obviously, guarantees aren't you know, not, you're not getting guaranteed returns. Of course, it's a roller coaster ride. It could go down. For illustration purposes only. <laughs> but again, if you start increasing that a little bit over time, that's going to make a big impact too. So if we increase by a hundred dollars per month each year. So, you know, in year one, it's a hundred dollars a month. In year two, it's two hundred dollars a month. In year three, it's three hundred dollars a month and you get that 7% rate of return, that's three and a half million dollars. 
instead of $275,000. And that's a huge difference. So by age 65, you're investing over $4,000 per month, which is a, a lot, obviously. But if you think about it, like, you know, you get cost of living increases every year. Um, you know, if we start increasing incrementally, it, it's not that hard of a, a hurdle or mental hurdle to get over, especially if we're making a good income. Um, and you could start a lot higher. Like, obviously, when, when we get to that point where we're making a good income, we can start being pretty aggressive at that point in time. Where would you suggest people start, Corey? I mean, just any amount's better than nothing, even 20 bucks a month. You just get it started. Getting started is the hardest part, and then commit to slowly increasing it over time. I mean, some of you might be thinking, oh, I'm not working at 25 because I'm a doctor. I don't get a real job until my 30s. It's like, well, true, you know, maybe while you're in med school and you don't save at all. But like if you go through college, med school, you start um, residency in your late 20s, like you can save $100 a month in your late 20s. Um, even on your residency income, and then your residency income is going to go up by more than 1200 a year, most likely. So you could take that pay increase and apply it to your savings every year. And then when you get into practice, I mean, shoot, you should be seeing more than $1,200 a year pay increases when you're in practice. So, mm -hmm. you know, get into that three and a half million dollar number by your mid 60s. Um, you know, I'd be disappointed if we're not more than that. Like if you start, think of, you know, if we start in practice and, and, and you start by maxing out your 401k and Roth IRA or backdoor Roth IRA, so 19,500 to the 401k, 6,000 to the IRA, and you just increase from there by $100 per month, you know, if you started at 25 and then, you know, you open a brokerage account the next year and put 100 a month into it and then, you know, keep maxing out the 401k and, and Roth IRA. Um, and then 200 a month the year after that to the brokerage account and keep increasing by 100 a month um, every year, you'd end up with 9 million by age 65. And what if we, instead of increasing by 100 a month, we increase by 200 a month every year. So 2,400 a month year one, 4,800 a month, year two, et cetera, et cetera. You'd end up with 33% more, closer to 12 million by age 65. So again, just a you know tiny little bit. It's not, you know, 100 a month for most doctors. That's, you know, pocket change. It's not a whole lot. You could swing it. I, I, I've seen your finances. You can do it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've seen enough of, your fi enough of the people listening. I've seen your finances to know that there's an extra 100 a month somewhere in there that you could manage to stick into an investment account if you really wanted to. Um, and just that compounding consistently over time, it really does add up if you stick with it. Um, again, no guarantees, of course, that your investments will go up in value. But, you know, you look throughout history at the stock market, um, real estate, commodity, like, you know, pretty much every investment historically uh, on a broad scale has, has gone up in value over time. Some years more than others. Some years they go down. But over a long period of time, not crazy to think that you see some growth in there and uh and end up with a pretty substantial sum at the end of the day absolutely and i know like these aren't numbers that are like your new goal like what what you're doing in your financial plan is, is completely different and dependent on on what your goals are and what the income is that you have and when you're getting started because like corey said a lot of you aren't getting started at age 25. so you know we're kind of missing out on the front end of that but you still, you have a lot of ability to make up lost ground with that increased income, for sure. You can actually start doing the same thing with debt too. You know, like the other side of compounding interest is the compounding interest that's accruing against you with your mortgage, with your student loans, if you have them and all of that kind of stuff. So if we're looking at just a fairly typical debt, like a mortgage, let's say we have a $600,000 mortgage at three and a quarter percent, that's a, a 30 year mortgage, which is you know a fairly typical number for right now. Interest rates are really low right now. That equates to about a $2,600 a month payment. But if you were to put $100 extra towards your mortgage each month, then instead of being paid off over 30 years, you'd be paid off to over 338 months, which is almost two years faster. Um, so again, you know all of those payments on the back end, you don't have to make them at all because you already paid them ahead of time. 
But if you were, again, to start increasing that payment incrementally over time, so each year you're paying another $100 per month extra. So year one, it's $100 extra, but year two, it's 200, year three, it's 300. Then that same mortgage would be paid off in just under 19 years. So you'd shave 11 years off of your mortgage by doing that. That's with interest rates where they are right now. Like they are very, 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 very low. For a lot of people taking out mortgages in the future, it may be that we end up with a higher interest rate. So those those micro actions become even more powerful when those interest rates are higher. So there's there's a lot of things that we can potentially do with our income. And a lot of them are, are, are very, very useful for your, your long-term financial plan. Both eliminating debt and increasing your savings for retirement is going to overall help that bottom line and what your net worth looks like. Yeah. And I think like Rochelle mentioned a minute ago, like the point isn't to say this is what you should be doing or, you know, you need to save this much more. But for a lot of you, when you're reading material online or you're trying to figure out how do I get to the end goal and maybe you're, you've concluded that you need $10 million to retire, you know, when 25 years from now, it's like, how the heck am I supposed to get there? That's like, that seems like climbing Mount Everest, uh, you know, impossible almost. Um, but just start with something and start small and then make a commitment to stick to it and make a commitment to gradually increase as time goes on. And I think the hardest part is just getting started. Once you start, you realize, oh, that wasn't so bad, even if it's a small mm-hmm. amount. And then those small increases every year are hardly noticeable. Again, most of you see more than a $1,200 a year pay raises, even just cost of living adjustments. If you're making 300,000, a 3% pay raise, you know, you're looking at like a 10,000 a year increase. So you could definitely increase your debt payments and your retirement savings by an extra hundred a month um, and, and still have some money to spare. So, and obviously everyone's situation is different. We all have different goals, concerns, hopes, dreams, things change over time. Um, you know, new kid, new house, more expensive, whatever, move to a higher cost of living area and we had to take a step back. But I think just the idea that if you can just get in that mindset of just start, doesn't matter where you start, just start and then <laughs> plan to increase gradually over time and and you'll be impressed where you end up yeah and the best use of that that hundred dollars a month or whatever it is like it all depends on where you're at like for some people it might make sense to put all of it towards retirement savings and none of it towards the mortgage for other people it might make sense to put it towards some other debt or something like that it really does depend on your financial circumstances but you can find a, a good use for that money and, and whatever it is especially if there's that interest behind it or that investment return behind it it's going to do a lot for you financially especially over a long period of time for sure mm-hmm. and I think looking at some other ways that you can apply this beyond just increasing investments or paying down debt you know, if we're looking at where do we come up with the money for some of you, just picking up an extra shift is a viable option. You you pick up one extra shift per month, you know, whether you're in residency and moonlighting or as an attending, you know, you just pick up an extra shift here or there. I mean, that could be an extra thousand or 2000 a month of income. And there you go. There's your, there's your hundred a month or, and then some on top of that. So, I mean, there's ways to, you know, work more to, to, to make those goals happen and make them a reality. Maybe you don't want that to be the case. Maybe we're working too much and we want to scale down a little bit and have an extra day to ourselves. But uh, that's one idea. Uh, what are some others, mm-hmm. Rochelle? There's lots of different things that you can do. Um, if you're not at the point where you're already maxing out your 401k, you could like auto increase your 401k contributions. Not every plan has this option, but sometimes when you're you're setting up what your contribution is, you can click a little button that says, I wanna increase it by 1% every year. Um, and, and then that happens without you even thinking about it. Like your paycheck gets a tiny bit smaller and you're like, what happened? But really 1% is, is not a huge deal for a lot of people. Um, you can also set other things up to auto increase or just to automatically revisit that every year. So every year in 
February when we're reviewing our finances, maybe we're like, well, we can put a little bit extra here, we can put a little bit extra there, whether it's like a 529 plan or debt or your brokerage account, if you have a brokerage account set up already. Um, and then like some people have to start really small and that's okay too. Like if it's $25 a month and you're just setting up $25 a month to go into a Roth IRA because you're in training and you're barely baking ends meet, like that can be an option too. And that can be set up to, to auto increase over time. Yeah. So there's a, a lot of different ways that you can just start by taking those small actions and let them grow on top of themselves. You can apply it to other things, like if you're charitably inclined, find a charity that you like, and pretty much all of them have auto monthly contribution options, or you can just hook up a credit card or a bank account and say, I'm going to donate five bucks a month, 10 bucks, a hundred bucks, whatever you want to do. And, uh, and then, you know, you've ended up helping a lot of people in a lot of ways from that. I think one thing that I've started doing, especially during the pandemic is just tipping a little extra you know, if I go get a meal or something or food delivery, you know, throw in an extra $10 or 20 bucks for the the wait staff, the, the delivery driver. I mean, it's not a whole lot of money out of my pocket, but it probably makes a bigger difference to them. You know, most of those people aren't making a whole lot. So an extra 10 or 20 bucks can, can, that can go a long way. Um, you know, in other areas of your life, you know, if you want to try and grow your knowledge base or or you know expand um you know your learning just start reading more just or reading period you know just even if it's <laughs> 10 pages a day just read 10 pages a day it'll take you 10 minutes 15 minutes maybe of a book and if you can you know just read 10 pages of a book every day before you know it you read about a book a month uh, that's 300 pages a month so 12 and books for a some year people it's a wonderful sleep aid you know <laughs> <For sure. laughs> read a little bit at bedtime at the end of your day you might get about 10 pages in and then you're out <laughs> that's my routine yeah <laughs> so, for, you know, so put the cell phone aside don't look at instagram mm -hmm. or local news or whatever turn off the screen start reading a book and yeah you'll be knocked out before you know it <laughs> And even a very small amount of exercise. I feel like that's what happens or what's happening with this little tiny dog. It's really not very much, but just getting up and out of my seat and making sure she goes outside to go to the bathroom and like taking her on a walk around the block because that's about as far as she could make it before just sitting down on the sidewalk. You know, it's it's definitely helpful, even that that little tiny bit. And obviously, if I can increase that a little bit each day, it'll be even better for each month. But yeah. I'm telling you the walking treadmill it's you, know, you don't even notice <laughs> it game and, changer yeah just if even if you don't have like an office you know if you're at a hospital and well if you're running around the halls of the hospital you probably log a lot of steps but even if you're like i don't know a radiologist just sitting there staring at images or a pathologist looking through a microscope you know get a walking treadmill and and do your work you know Mm -hmm. while walking or or again even at home you know this thing's pretty small i could you could like slide it under a coffee table or under the couch it's like it's only sits a few inches off the ground um under your bed you know while you're watching tv it's uh you know again just it's an hour you've walked three miles it's, <laughs> i mean most of you watch more than an hour of tv per day on average um mm -hmm. so it's uh it adds up one other thing I was thinking about is, is time. You know, if you can save yourself a little bit of time every day, like that's really powerful too, depending on how you use it. Even if you just use it to sit and see the flowers or something ridiculous. I mean, like I, I was thinking about this with commuting and with the pandemic and how, you know, I, I some people even in medicine have been able to do more from home. And I know that there are some like pros and cons to that for sure. But, you know, if you don't have that commute and you can use that time for yourself in some way, I think that's that's pretty powerful, too. Yeah, for sure. Get one of those meditation apps, sit there for five mm -hmm. minutes and uh, zen out. Read your 10 pages. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Anything else you can think of, Rochelle? I think we're good. Thanks for listening, you guys. Talk again next time.
We would love to hear your feedback and suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing podcast at thefinitygroup.com or by following Finity Group on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Finity Group LLC. You can follow me on Twitter at Corey Janoff CFP, Instagram at Corey Janoff, or on LinkedIn under my name, Corey Janoff. You can follow me on Twitter at Rochelle Finance or on Instagram, Vanderzanen Rochelle, or on LinkedIn under my name, Rochelle Vanderzanen. Check out all of the podcast episodes on the finitygroup.com slash podcast on our Finity Group YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to check out our Financial Clarity blog at thefinitygroup.com slash blog. Thanks for listening to this episode of Financial Clarity for Doctors by Finity Group, LLC.